Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is having a wonderful first day of Hanukkah. And uh, as we get ready for Shabbos, uh, I share with you this thought in honor of Shabbos Hanukkah. And uh, with great appreciation, we have three sponsors for this week's video, Dvar Torah. We first thank the anonymous sponsor, Yechi Reuven, who's sponsoring both in honor of Shabbos Mavarchim for Rosh Chodesh Teves, and also with blessings for Hasaras Magif Azume Aleinu, davening that Hashem should remove the pandemic from the world. Thank you. Uh, we also want to thank Jonathan and Tamima Cohen, who are sponsoring the video Dvar Torah in memory of Jonathan's father, Edward Max Cohen, Yisrael Mordechai Ben Yaakov, Zichron Levracha, whose yurt site will be on the 2nd of Teves. And uh, we thank Jonathan and Tamima, and it should be as a chos and aliyah for, um, uh, for uh, Jonathan's father's neshama. And finally, we also thank the Wertheimer family, who is sponsoring the Dvar Torah in honor of Devorah's 18th birthday. And so we wish uh, Devorah a happy birthday, and, uh, and thank you to the Wertheimers. I read the primary, even if it's just a few lines, primary text found in the Talmud about the holiday of Hanukkah. When the Greeks entered the temple, the Beis HaMikdash. Timu kol they defiled it, they ransacked it, and they uh, rendered impure all of the oil, Shabbat in the temple. But when the Chashmonayim uh, were successful and uh, became stronger than the Greeks, Vinitzchum, and they defeated them, they re-entered the Beis HaMikdash, Badku, they searched its grounds, Vlomatsu Ela Pach Echad Shel Shaman. They only found one cruise of oil. Shai Munach Bechosamo Shel Kohen Gadol, that was still sealed with the insignia of the Kohen Gadol. One final, small, pure cruise of oil, with all that symbolism, with bearing the name of the Kohen Gadol. Vlohaibo El Hadlik Yomecha, but it was only enough, as we know to normally, naturally, burn for one day. Vanasa but there was a miracle, v'hiliku mimenu shmona yamim. And they lit it, and it lasted for eight days. We all know the story. Let us try imagine, though, what it would have looked like, what the scene would have been when they lit that menorah that evening, and when they came back the next day and that next evening, and it was still burning. What would the Beis HaMikdash look like? Well, to begin imagining it, we can gain insight from another discussion in the Talmud. The Gemara is discussing from what materials is it valid to make the menorah, the candelabra, and the base of Migdash. Ideally, it should be gold, of course. But what if there isn't gold, or what if there is not enough gold? Can it be made from other precious metals? Can it be made even from other materials? And one opinion the Gemara says that if absolutely necessary, you can even make a very uh, plain, not fancy menorah, even using wood. Even using wood. And what is this proof? Because... It was known that the Hashmanayim initially, when they lit this small one cruise of oil, lit it on a wooden menorah. Because when they entered the base of Megdash, it had been ransacked. The menorah apparently had been stolen. Or maybe we can imagine branches of it had been broken off. And the golden menorah wasn't there. So they, uh, you know, on short notice, put together... They got some pieces of wood, nailed it together, and made a menorah until, as the Gemara explains, until they were able to, uh, to um, uh, rebuild a more beautiful, more appropriate menorah. But what that helps us realize and imagine is that the base of Migdash would have been ransacked. You know, the Greeks put in idolatrous images, forms, sculptures. We can imagine the gold and silver had been pillaged. We can imagine curtains and other... Um, uh, decorations would have been ripped, would have been lying on the ground. There may have been um, uh, blood in places. This was in the middle of a war. There were battles in Yushalayim. You could have imagined other garbage things left by the Greek soldiers. And so when the Hashmanayim, when the Jews militarily regained control of the Beis Amigdash, it's not like they walked back into the beautiful, sparkling, gorgeous, honorable Beis HaMikdash. It was a wreck. It was a mess. It was ritually impure, many of its objects. And we can imagine when they found it, 
They would have been shocked. They would have been horrified. They would have felt shame. And some of them may have argued that even if we found, okay, we found one bottle of oil. It's one bottle of oil. Anyways, it's only for one day. Why light it? It's inappropriate to light. It's disrespectful to light it looking around what we see. But apparently others and the leaders decided there is a cruise of oil. There is a mitzvah to light the menorah. We are going to light the menorah. And so they did. And then they came back the next day. It was still burning, as you would expect. And then they noticed when the sun was setting the following day, and it became night, it was still burning. And it burned into the next day. And it burned for eight days until they were able to produce new pure oil. And it was burning. The menorah was burning while around them, again, was a mess. Around them was defilement. They were still cleaning up, fixing, making repairs pulling out the idolatrous materials. And so when they saw the miracle of the candle burning, they realized it contained great significance, great symbolism. They saw great meaning in it. They saw, first of all, that they were right to light the menorah. While others thought inappropriate, they should wait till we can properly rededicate a beautiful, honorable temple. They were right to light it immediately. It was a sign that they were right to fight the Greeks at all, which was hotly debated. The symbolism of seeing that, or those few flames burning, again, amidst destruction, amidst this wrecked, messed, Beis Amigdash, defiled, impure. They saw a symbol of hope. That we will persevere, we will make it through it, we will rededicate the Beis Amigdash. There is purity and there is holiness left. I would imagine if I was there, you would also see, I would also see and feel a great sense of beauty this beautiful light in a not beautiful temple. And maybe it also would have made them realize that the sparkling gold and silver and beautiful tapestries that the base Manish did have, the aesthetics that the Greeks valued so much, which has its place, was not the essence of the Beis HaMikdash. There is something more beautiful. The fire which symbolized the human spirit, determination, higher purpose, meaning, holiness. That too is beautiful and really much more beautiful than any Greek conception. And so it wasn't just the symbolism of the miracle of oil burning longer than naturally it should, but it was the symbolism of, of that fire burning despite its surroundings, despite everything else around it, despite the destruction, the mess, the disrespect, the defilement, despite the war, even with that, despite all of that, the fire would burn. I do not want to be too dramatic, and obviously we cannot totally compare today to the time of the miracle of Hanukkah. But last night I stand here in the main sanctuary, and last night we davened. We normally do not daven uh, regular minchamar of the main sanctuary. Last night, the first night of Hanukkah we did, and that was in order to be able to light our indeed beautiful uh, large menorah in the main sanctuary. And in some ways, it is a similar scene. I'm not sure if you can make it out in any of the places, but there are rows taped off. It's clear as we dive into the main sanctuary that we are in a COVID-19 world. You can if I turn the screen, you can see the, the divider for how they receive aliyahs. 
There were fewer people than there normally would have been at a mincha marv of Hanukkah. Normally it is such a special moment uh, at the young Israel of Brookline that normally it's Sunday night, some night of Hanukkah. There's a children's event and tens of children come into the main sanctuary and we light the menorah together. We will not have this this year. But despite all of that, despite that setting, despite that, the sadness, we lit the menorah, we sang Ma'ut Sor, and it was, it was beautiful. Certainly that was my feeling, and it symbolized, like it did for the Hashmanayim, our hope, our spirit, our faith in Hashem, the sense that Hashem is with us. All of the same messages of Hanukkah and why Hashem miraculously made the menorah burn for eight days uh, in the days of the miracle of, of Hanukkah. And so, <clears throat> over the remainder of Hanukkah next week, uh, I encourage you uh, to come in person or virtually to see. It's a beautiful sight, the lighting of the menorah in particular. Uh, I encourage everyone, I ask you, I invite you, Sunday evening, Mincha is at 4 p.m. Hopefully many people will be available at that time for those who are comfortable coming in person, who perhaps come on Shabbos. I would encourage you to consider to come Davin this Sunday evening uh, at Shul in person. Of course, it is absolutely necessary to sign up to make sure that we have the proper spaces and spacing for everyone, as is always necessary to sign up in advance for any minion. And if you will, if you're not yet comfortable coming in person or your plans do not allow you to come in person, you should sign in on Zoom. We've uh, got it down by now. We know how to do it. And I think it could be an incredibly meaningful, powerful moment. Let us come together in person and virtually and let us have a large group. Let us first, we'll daven mincha at 4 p.m. Let's take this time, a few minutes to daven, to daven to Hashem. We will light the menorah. You will be a part of it. We will sing Ma'ut Sor. I will share a, a brief thought on Hanukkah. And I think it can be a really special, meaningful, beautiful moment uh, for the community. So I hope uh, you will consider that. And uh, I hope everyone is having a wonderful Hanukkah. And uh, I hope everyone will have a meaningful, inspiring, joyous Shabbos Hanukkah which is coming very soon.